Disappointed. Another whole day to wait. Marcel arrived on time the next day and found Forrester already dressed in the clothes he had been given, complete with spectacles and berry. You have the device in your pocket? Questioned Marcel. Yes, replied Forrester. What's the mission? I will tell you as we ride along. I have borrowed a velo for you from the house. Here, take these. He handed Forrester an identity card and a driving license. Dr. Girard is not only our doctor, he is also our forger. Forrester looked at the documents and smiled. I hope nobody back home ever sees these. The bicycle was old but sturdy and Forrester wobbly at first soon got it under control. They cycled off together down to the village. They rode down the lane away from the manor and Marcel explained what they were about to do. The Bosch stockpiled a massive amount of ma arms, am ammunition and even military vehicles in, Cal in the Calais region, ready for the invasion of Angleterre. Now, after Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, they need those arms at the Eastern Front. They are shipping them by rail, and there will be a train coming through at 10.30 tonight. What about the curfew? If we get stopped, went on myself, I will, say, I will say that we are turning a tractor board from another farm. I will do the talking. You and Rennie are my employees. I'm sure they will let us pass as it involves food production. The Bosch steal 80% of French pr produce. But as for coming back late tonight, that's a different matter. We will wait it out until morning. <clears throat> Boy, it suggested this as they rode along. It looked like another uncomfortable night. The truck, a three-ton 1937 Renault, was hidden behind the village school. When they arrived, Rene was already there. The two Frenchmen greeted one another cheerfully, and Rene smiled and nodded at Forrester. It was a flat-fronted, cab-over-engine truck, and Forrester walked round it inspecting it as if it was his airplane and he was about to go on a sortie. He pulled the rear canvas to one side and looked at in the back. There stood an ancient tractor. It drifted in oil but otherwise looked to me in good condition. Marcel looked at his watch. We should go. Can you drive it? No problem. Forrester climbed up into the cab and sat behind the wheel. They set off along a quiet tree-lined road with Rennie sitting in the middle of the bench seat. They drove past field after field of ripened crops. Good year, remarked Forrester. It would be if the Germans let us keep it, muttered Marcel. They had driven about nine kilometers when they rounded a bend and, and ahead of them, under a stand of tall elms, a red boom barred their way. Mud, explained Marcel. Forrester felt his knees go weak. He bent his head and slipped the device into his mouth before slowing the truck and stopping at the barrier. Three soldiers at the Wehrmacht stood at strategic points around the checkpoint watching them, their weapons at the ready. A tall soldier bearing the insignia of an hunter officer came out of a small hut situated nearby and walked slowly towards the driver's side. Forrester lowered the window and at the same time adjusted his trouser leg slightly to make it easier to draw the pistol. Papiers, commanded the German. Forrester pulled his new identity card from his pocket. The soldier snatched it. None, he said. Some guttural noises came from Forrester's throat and he pointed to his distorted mouth. He cannot speak, said Marcel from the other side of the cab. If you would come this side, I will explain. The soldier frowned and moved around the front of the truck. Marcel said, he works for me, a good worker. His affliction does not affect what he does. The soldier asked for Marcel's and ran his papers and said, and he's all right to, and he's all right to drive. His affliction does not affect his intelligence, replied Marcel. The soldier took half a step back and stiffened. You're on breach of the curfew, he said. We're on far bi farm business, countered Marcel. He went on to explain about the borrowed tractor. Why are you returning at this time? Why not earlier or in the morning? We work late on the farm and we start early. We were using it until past curfew and the other farm needs it first thing in the morning. On a farm, while there is daylight, there is work to be done. The soldier grunted and looked about him. It was already dusk. He called two of the others over and they searched the truck. They checked underneath in the engine compartment and inside the canvas-covered body of the truck. They even checked the tractor thoroughly for anything hidden. At last they were satisfied. The soldier returned their papers. You may go, he said, and next time you must observe the curfew. Forrester, who had understood only a fraction of what had been going on, felt a wave of relief as the barrier was lifted. He restarted the engine and slipped the truck into gear. As soon as they were well clear of the truck, the checkpoint, Forrester said, I assume we are going to blow up this train. 
Indeed, agreed Marcel. With what? The soldiers didn't find anything. Marcel grinned. The soldiers were not meant to find anything. You will see. They continued their journey, seeing few people or other traffic, eventually coming to a place where the railway embankment was some 20 feet above the road. Turn left here, instructed Marcel. Forrester turned off the road onto a cart track that led through a wooded area. He was guided to a place where the truck would be hidden by surrounding bushes and trees. Marcel again looked at his watch. There is a passenger train coming through at 9.45. There are guards posted all along the line. We must complete the job in less than half an hour, so we'll have to work fast, but first the explosives. Rennie climbed into the back of the truck, unclipped the harness of the tractor. He then released the gear and pushed it forward about four feet, once more demonstrating his size and good strength. Marcel joined Rennie with a flashlight and then between them they lifted a portion of the truck's floor. It soon became apparent that the truck had a false bottom, but only of a shallow depth, making it difficult to discern from the outside. Marcel, pu Marcel pulled out a block of what appeared to be greenish plasticine. He looked at Forrester and said, Nobel 808 <coughs> plastic explosive, courtesy of your government. So that's what we bring over in those containers. Marcel grinned, among other things. Outside it was dark, lit only by the feeble incandescence, incandescence of a crescent moon. Rennie walked away silently to scout the area around them, while Forrester helped Marcel to gather and pack the equipment. Explosives, detonators, wire, plunger, tools for digging. They were, read, they were ready with three loaded ha haversacks when Rennie returned out of the darkness. He spoke rapidly to Marcel in French. There are guards posted along the line about 400 meter intervals, Marcel explained to Forrester. We will select a place about halfway between two of them, but it's essential we make no noise. They each picked up a haversack and Marcel led the way as Forrester digested this latest information. The guards, they will march up and down the line, won't they? They won't just remain in one place, probably, replied Marcel, but we must be vigilant. It has to be done. They selected a spot that seemed ideal. It was on the high embankment between the, and between the guards. They hid in the nearby bushes to wait for the passenger train to go through. The plan is, uh, said Marcel, I will set the explosives here, which will take out the engine. Rennie will go up the track about 50 metres and set more explosives, which hopefully will cause secondary explosions to destroy some of the ammunition. We will cause... We will lay the explosive to this side of the track, hoping to push the train over the other side. What do you want me to do, asked Forrester? Stay on guard, be vigilant, let us know if you see anything. The passenger's train went through on time, and as soon as it was clear, the three men were climbing the embankment. Forrester watched as Marcel bent to the task of scooping out the earth and gravel to partially bury the rectangular blocks. Rennie walked over into the darkness, carrying a haversack and unspooling a reel, leaving the wire running along the ground beside the track. Forrester crept back to the bottom of the embankment and, keeping to the shadows, made his way down the track. He had not gone more than 100 metres before he dropped to his knees. A guard with rifle and fixed bayonet stood alert, his tall stature and coal scuttle hat silhouetted against the night sky. The guy seemed to be looking up the track towards Marcel. Had the guard seen anything? Forrester lay concealed in the shrubbery, watching, waiting for the soldier to make a move. 